يسألونك ماذا أحل لهم قل أحل لكم الطيبات وما علمتم من الجوارح مكلبين تعلمونهن مما علمكم الله فكلوا مما أمسكنا عليكم واذكروا اسم الله عليه واتقوا الله إن الله سريع الحساب. They ask you as to what has been made lawful for them. Say, made lawful for you are good things, and hunting through. Birds and beasts of prey that you train, teaching them out of what Allah has taught you. So, eat of what they hold for you, and recite the name of Allah upon it. Fear Allah. Surely, Allah is swift at reckoning. So, this verse is mentioning about that because they must have asked what is the reason for what is halal and not. So, this is mentioned that anything which is being by your uh, animal which you train a hunting animal such as hawks and uh, a dogs and whatnot you keep those before the animal dies you capture them and say bismillah allahu akbar and slaughter their throat and that become halal uh, but if any animal which has been already partially eaten by the beast and is already dead we are not supposed to eat that animal uh, fishes are allowed. All the fishes which is in the oceans are allowed. Oceanic creatures are allowed. Uh, crustaceans are considered makru. Makru means they are not preferred because they are bottom feeders. Uh, so if a fish which dies and come on the surface before death, if it comes on the surface and you capture it, it's allowed. When it is already blown up, some people uh, explode bomb underwater and the fish die and come on the surface belly up they're not supposed to be eaten. If they're died of infection and disease and they come up and laying on the floor, they are not supposed to be eaten. We need to have, you have to capture fish alive. That is to be allowed to be eaten. This is again a Sharia thing. Uh, let's listen to the verse number five. <laughs> والمحصنات من المؤمنات والمحصنات من الذين أوتوا الكتاب من قبلكم والمحصنات من الذين أوتوا الكتاب من قبلكم إذا آتيتموهن أجورهن محصنين محصنين غير مسافحين ولا متخذي أخدان ومن يكفر بالإيمان فقد حبط عمله وهو في الآخرة من الخاسرين. To verse number five, Allah subhanahu wa taala says, اليوم أحل لكم الطيبات. Today. Good things have been made lawful for you. And the food which was being given to the people of the scriptures is lawful for you. And your food is allowed for them. And lawful is good women from among those who were given the scripture before you provided you gave them their dowers so ujur means their dowry these are the righteous women and neither for the lust reason nor for paramours uh, and whoever reject faith and whoever reject the faith and efforts will be wasted. And in the 
and uh, in the end, in the hereafter, that person will be a loser. So this verse number five has a lot of important things to discuss. Today we have allowed which is lawful, which is clean and pure food for you. And the food from the people like Jews and Christians, which is lawful for you. And the food is lawful for them and your food they can eat. And a good woman from amongst believers and good woman from amongst those who were given the book before you. So, uh, وَالْمُحْسَنَاتُ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنَاتِ وَالْمُحْسَنَاتُ مِنَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ So among the Muslims, be married to those who are righteous women and those be righteous women for the people of scriptures such as Jews and Christians. إِذَا آتَيْتُمُهُنَّ أُجُورَهُنَّ After when you give as a gift and the dowry and man has to give it to a woman. غَيْرَ uh, مُسَافِحِينَ That's not the intention for the lust. وَلَا مُتَّخِذِ الْأَخْذَانِ And not just... Uh, nor having a paramours so uh, which is means that you're not just you know uh, prostitution in the other words to use now uh, the important point here to understand uh, Muslim woman is not allowed to marry a non-Muslim man they have to be Muslim why because all cultures men dominate and they can influence the woman's uh, Muslima and he would not know uh, the rights of Muslim woman Okay, you need to understand that part. Why? Because Muslims have rules. So if a non-Muslim doesn't know that they're not allowed to have relation while she's having sickness or, or, or period or uh, the thing is that her divorce. Uh, in Islam, we have three times man has to say, I have divorced or divorce you and he believe in Allah. And the non-Muslim man, when he divorced, the right of divorce is in his hand and he does not believe in her faith. He would, how he would treat her. Then the rights of women, which Quran talks about that she has to inherit from the wealth his faith does not take those inheritance in the way. The children's will be his name, and the woman is the one who is going to be raising the children for him. So all these important part of the Muslim women's right will be violated because the man she's marrying is not a Muslim. So this is not just a discrimination. It is for her protection, that if you understand. Uh, even though that many people do not care, and they say that, okay, we want to marry to Jewish men. Uh, again, people can do what they want to, but Islam protects the women by giving their rights. And those rights are not given in, in, in Judaism or Christianity. And if you want to, don't trust my words, there's going to be an hour-long lengthy lecture differences, I can tell you. First of all, the Jewish woman is also not allowed to, to come in the altar when they get married because they're considered not holy. Second thing is they're not allowed to open the Torah or touch the Torah or read the Torah. They can only take the smoke on Sabbath evening, Friday night as a part of act of their worship. And there's uh, Islam, she has inheritance. She has a gift and right to keep it. And uh, a man can only marry four wives. And then the non-Muslim, they can take as many they want or they can restrict any they want. And Islam, there are three times he has to divorce her to be not uh, be married anymore. And one man who ever marries a woman, he has to take Jesus not as a God, as Allah is a God. If she's marrying a Christian man, if she's marrying a Jewish man, he does not believe in Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So how this Islamic life she can live, she has to pray five times a day and he may not want her to pray five times a day. Her rights to visit family, her rights to uh, the, the expenses and the right to be maintain and provide it, uh, shelter, clothing and food. So if they don't believe in those things, if they do not honor, they may do some, they may not do all, but as a Muslim, they have to believe in all of that. So that's why the Muslim woman is given a protection by telling, do not marry a non-Muslim man. And if a Muslim man who does wrong to her, she can demand a divorce and be married to another man, which in their religion, there's no divorce in Christianity, by the way. Uh, they have to do the civil divorce. Hindu faith, obviously out of picture completely because they worship idols and their rules and things are same as with the Christian and whatnot in regards that there's no law about the marriage life. There's no right for the inheritance. There's no rights on the maintenance of the wife. So all this thing. And then if she become widowed, they treat her as an outcast, as a uh, uh, I don't want to mention, but she become she's not allowed to dress. She is not allowed to socialize or mingle with people. Now maybe they have changed things. And apparently what I have heard, which is unbelievable, I never known until recently I learned, uh, a widow could be abused physically and sexually by her father-in-law and other family members, male. 
and she cannot see it, she cannot have anything. So there are a lot of things. Islam gives the perfect way of life. That's where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's divine law comes into play. So this is where which Muslims are being told that do not marry a Muslim woman to a non-Muslim man, but Muslim men can take only a non-Muslim woman when they can influence her and they would not be intimidated by the culture and where the child has a more non-Islamic uh, preference. So many scholars do not perform those wedding, provided that you gave them their dowers. So you need to give the mahar to non-Muslim and Muslim if ever you take it. Binding yourself in a marriage, neither going to lust and nor having paramour. So the marriage is a serious commitment. Obviously, a person can go to prostitute and just pay some money and have lust. But the marriage is expensive. You have to maintain, you have to put up, and you have to provide the needs of the person. Whoever rejects faith and this effort will go to the waste because whoever denies it, their efforts will be wasted. And in the hereafter, he will be among the losers. So we don't live in this world alone. We live for hereafter also. Uh, let's listen to the verse number six. يا أيها الذين آمنوا إذا قمتم إلى الصلاة فاغسلوا وجوهكم وأيديكم إلى المرافق فاغسلوا وجوهكم وأيديكم إلى المرافق وامسحوا برؤوسكم وأرجلكم إلى الكعبين وَإِن كُنتُمْ جُنُبًا فَاطَّهَّرُوا وَإِن كُنتُمْ مَرْضَى أَوْ عَلَى سَفَرٍ أَوْ جَاءَ أَحَدٌ مِّنكُم مِّنَ الْغَائِطِ أَوْ جَاءَ أَحَدٌ مِّنكُم مِّنَ الْغَائِطِ أو لامستم النساء فلم تجدوا أو لامستم النساء فلم تجدوا ما فتيمموا صعيدا طيبا فتيمموا صعيدا طيبا فامسحوا بوجوهكم وأيديكم من ما يريد الله ليجعل عليكم من حرج ولكن يريد ليطهركم وليتم نعمته عليكم ولكن يريد ليطهركم وليتم نعمته عليكم لعلكم تشكرون Oh you who believe when you rise for salah, prayer, wash your faces and your hands up to the elbows, and make mash, wiping by hands, of your heads and, wash, your feet up to the ankles. If you are in a state of major impurity, cleanse yourselves well, by taking bar. If you are sick, or on a journey, or if one of you has come after relieving himself, or you have had sexual contact with women, and you find no water, then, go for some clean dust and wipe your faces and hands with it. Allah does not like to impose a problem on you. He rather likes to cleanse you and to complete his favor upon you, so that you may be grateful. So this is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not giving command. You see, all these verses are addressing to the believers. Ya ayyulazina amanu means, O you who believe. Iza qumtum ila salat when you stand up for the prayer. Faqusulu wujuhakum means this is the instruction how to do the wudu. Faqusulu wujuhakum, wash your face. Wa aidiyakum ila marafiq. Marafiq means hand wash till the elbow. Wamsihu birusikum wa masahu. Wamsahu means masah. What you do is take a little water and you rub it from the forehead. At least one th two quarter to one third of the head should be wrapped, wiped here. And then you bring your finger down. You run in the ears. You run in the oracles of the ear pinna. And then you rub it behind the ear from the thumb. And then you rub in the nap of the neck down to the 
jugular vein. This is also balances the vagus nerve, which is very interesting. It can calm down a person's vagus nerve, right side control heart and lung, left side control guts and bowels and all the internal organs, the longest nerve in the human body. Um, that is something very importantly involved. And you know, karate chop when people hit here, the heartbeat slows down, people faint, that is what it is. So um, the vagus nerve, is a part of massage. It helps the anxiety and depression also, by the way, when you rub the hand. And this is because the vagus nerve is superficial on the ear and come down the neck and go down in deep. So, and this is where we do carotid massage when you do a pat, people having a fast heartbeat. So this is one of the massage part of it. And wash your, uh, see, you see, uh, this is you need to wash your feet from ankle to the heel and the tip of the toe. So all finger, all four toes, or five toes and the web space between the fingers should be rubbed with the wet water with the fingers and make sure they are not dry. Prophet says when the heels were dry on somebody, he says that's the fire, means it will be in the hellfire. So we need to make sure we wash it. Now I met a person from the Shia school of Shia and he says from Sahu is for the head and the, and the feet. It's not that, Masaha is again a wet hand to be rubbed over that, but when we run water on the feet and the ankle, as the Hadith of Prophet says, then you need to wet them to the point the water will be flowing on them. Ghusl. So you see, this is Faghusulu. Wujuhakum, wash your face. Ghusl means running water. Waidiyakum, and run the hand, a water down the elbow. Aidiyakum, wal ilal marafiq, till the elbow. Elbow, tip of the elbow should be also wet, and that should be use carefully and rub water through this head and the forehead one third of it up to the front people sometimes have less hair they should go as far as the head goes your hairline is uh, and your feet till the ankle so this person was telling me that they only put three fingers wet and drop it on the dorsum of the foot according to hadith the description is you need to touch the heel and wet the heel also and run the water through them if a person has a limited amount of water they should uh, not to waste water prophet says that if you are by the river flowing don't waste the water in other words that this is something very important which is double aspect physical aspect is to clean the dirt out of you the spiritual aspect it it washes the sin of a person's hand and feet have committed and a head and body is committed and when you have become a you had basically junban is a, a orgasmic experience a person has then you need a full major cleanliness which is major cleanliness which i mentioned earlier in the ghusl the wudu has four four uh, uh, fard, which is washing face doing a masa washing hand till the elbow and washing the feet four fard. the rest is sunnah and the wajibat uh, the ghusl has three obligation which is um, uh, gargling the throat rinsing the nose and washing the head to toe with the water and that is uh, water purifies human body. It should be flowing water, not a stagnant water. Do not use a stagnant water. It is not allowed. And if uh, if you are sick or in a journey and one of you have come back after using a bathroom means uh, urination or defecation or you have had orgasm sexual intercourse with a woman if you do not find water so you do the uh, uh, cleanliness with the clean dirt or the rock because they are all in same nature the mud or the dirt or the rock, rock uh, dry di dust and what you do is first thing three obligation in the tayammum uh, niya every time the intention is important in the all action is built on the niya every time when we do anything Muslim make a niya and what you do is you make a niya then what you do is you clap your both hands onto the dirt you clap it like this and you do from face down and then you do tap again clean it and you go from left to this thing and then you go from this hand here to this thing 
and that will complete your purity till you find enough water to make wudu you do water wudu if you find enough water to do the ghusl you can do ghusl but if you are sick and you are afraid of your life and health and you have to perform the salah then do the ghusl or wudu or tayammum whichever is available till you complete your salah do not miss the salah salah is obligation but without wudu and purification they are not allowed uh, so Allah does not uh, like to have any inhibition in you. Allah wants you to be cleaned and complete that. Uh, so he could complete his rewards upon you. So that you may thank him. So this is verse number six, which we stop here. And inshallah, next Friday, uh, Sunday, we will meet again to continue from the verse number seven.